Well, it's wonderful to see so many of you here after hours now, so we're officially off the clock for those who are faculty and staff, but thank you for sticking around and being here for this really important conversation. On behalf of all of us at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, we're really thrilled to have an opportunity to talk about some of these scientific discoveries in partnership with the ethical and sometimes even moral dilemmas that they raise and present. One of the things we do in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is have programs of academic excellence. So we know that our students in the STEM fields as well as the humanities and social sciences are going to be future leaders. We prepare them by giving them an excellent education, active mentorship. One of our other features in our mission statement is that we actively cultivate a culture of scholarship between faculty and students so that they have that one-on-one -on -one mentoring that prepares them for advanced study and often civic engagement, vocational success, and we hope at the end, a well-lived life. So we're really grateful to have the opportunity for this kind of robust program where we have not only the combination of scientific experts as well as some ethicists and others who can speak into the moral and Christian perspectives that are often uh, either overlooked or sometimes overly simplified. So thank you, uh, panelists, for joining me. And I'll just do a quick introduction. You've all received the bios here, so you can read for yourself. They're very impressive credentials, so we won't take time to do that. But obviously, if you stuck around for the first session, uh, you know that Dr. Ting Wu is a renowned Harvard-educated geneticist who's at the front of this genetic revolution that we're now experiencing. And we're so grateful for her earlier remarks that even I, who had gen bio a very long time ago, <laughs> could follow. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, she's uh, next to her is Dr. Nathan Joe, and he's from Amgen Technologies. So if you know the co the company Amgen that does biotechnology research and application, he will here uh, be able to share from his experience. Uh, he's also a native of Cal Poly Pomona at the undergraduate level, uh, and lives in South Th Thousand Oaks. So he's a local Southern California resident. We're grateful that you made the drive. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we know that's a sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, and then on his left is Dr. Rico Vitz, who's our very own APU chair of the De uh, Department of Philosophy and, of course, has spoken into many of these issues in the past. And he's become a frequent panelist for Chris events. So he's our go-to ethicist. Uh, no pressure at all. And the fact that it's video recorded, I'm sure, doesn't give him any nerves. Uh, but we are really grateful to have your partnership in these events. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Hello, so my name is Dr. Joshua Morris, and I am um, going to be the moderator for this discussion. Uh, just to give you a little heads up, so how this is going to work is each panelist will be given an, about 10 minutes to give some background information and to present on um, different thoughts with regard to science, ethics, with relation to this topic. And then we'll have a time for questions. Um, if you do have a question, um, you see a link up here, uh, please submit to that link, and then we will ask the questions um, when we get to the question time. Um, if you have a question for a specific panelist, please put in the question which panelist you'd like to um, submit it to, so that way I don't have to guess. Um, but if not, we can probably figure it out. Um, so to get started, um, I'd like to bring up Dr. Ting Wu again, and thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. I think. I do not have photographic memory. I think most of you were here earlier, so I will actually not go through um, what was said before, except to say that the CRISPR therapy or CRISPR technology is really just the current point in a long line of technologies that um, human beings have tried to come up with in order to have some control over their genome. And this control, I, I believe, is why we are all here today. But I will use my 10 minutes to tell you about two other things that I didn't have time to say before. Um, because I, I do think that the more you see everything that's going on, the more we'll be able to have the feedback we need. The first is that your inheritance, you know how you study genetics and they say that you get your DNA from your mom and your dad and that's you. Well, several years ago, people discovered um, in a woman that she was carrying the Y chromosome. And she was a fertile woman, so they thought this is very strange. And they studied this Y chromosome. And it wasn't just a little bit of Y. It was a lot of Y. 
in her bloodstream. And they discovered that there were certain cells in her bloodstream that were carrying the Y chromosome, but many cells were two Xs. So they looked at the Y and discovered that that was the Y chromosome that her husband had. And so therefore, it was the Y chromosome that their son had. And that was the beginning of a discovery made by Di Diana Bianchi that makes us now understand that the DNA you inherit from your parents, an egg and the sperm, while it's a lot of the DNA, it's not all of it. Because mothers, when they're carrying their children, accept cells from their fetal children that go into their bloodstream and can live in them for decades, 30, 40, 50 years. These cells are probably stem-like because they can divide and last for so long. How many of them are there? About two per mil, so a lot. And some researchers have found that if the mother is wounded, that those cells tend to aggregate there. They also may be responsible for some autoimmune diseases. It turns out the fetal cells can inherit maternal cells into them. So you, all of you, almost certainly carry some cells that are your mother's cells in you, and you will carry them forever. The question now is, can you now pass your mother's cells into your children unchanged? This raises the issue of what inheritance really is and how many generations past can you remember something. The other thing I wanted just to briefly mention before we get into the topic of ethics is that sometimes when I visit classrooms and we talk about the use and misuse, the potential benefits and ethical issues of using genetics, very most often I will be in a room with individuals who fairly are fairly adamant about not misusing genetics, creating enhancements, selecting for certain traits only. But then, when I bring up the issue of space travel and astronauts and going into extreme environments, it's very interesting how the conversation changes because in the absence of changing ourselves, humans may end up limiting themselves to a very thin sphere around Earth. And I won't tell you how the conversation goes, but it's something that I also um, direct the Consortium for Space Genetics at Harvard Medical School. And this is one of the issues that we talk about, um, which is how much genetic, tech, how many, how should we use genetic technologies to um, protect astronauts? All right, so I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Louis and, and Don uh, who invited me here. I could illustrate the, um, the, the proposal that I'm going to make. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to uh, decide whether gene editing is ethical or unethical, whether we should accept it or not, not accept it, but I'm going to invite you to um, uh, ask questions and and uh, and learn more about it before uh, we make decisions. And um, so, yes. Oh, yeah. So because I work at a company, I have to put out disclaimer. Uh, <laughs> all information here is public information. I'm not representing my company. I'm not. I'm not your doctor. I'm not your lawyer. Uh, my title is scientist, but I'm not your scientist. And. <laughs> And uh, when we uh, talk about gene editing, I, I don't know, it's, it's a picture like this, something, something like this, what you have in mind. It's not a failed CRISPR experiment. It's a, it's a piece by Picasso. I think it's called Artist and uh, uh, it's, it's model or something. Uh, uh, but before we go into that, an important uh, information that I like to uh, put out is that I am Christian. I read Bible and pray every day to find, to, to search my heart and, and find a way to love God more by loving others as I love myself. So given that, whether gene editing is uh, acceptable or unacceptable, it's a very complex question. And from the uh, perspective that I developed by being a scientist, uh, it's, uh, so I belong to this sub category of human being called scientist. And um, I, 
so my kind even makes up a small, a smaller uh, subgroup within scientists. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm called biophysicist, but essentially, I like to uh, practice evidence-based method to search uh, testable truth. And uh, recently, I transitioned uh, in, into biotech company where the, the goal of the company is to use science to make something useful focused on the, the health of the patient. And at the same time, uh, it's a company, so we have to generate wealth. And uh, can we find the common ground uh, where um, uh, religion and, and, and science and biotech can overlap? And uh, with the question whether gene editing is acceptable, I could go uh, all over the place. But to better define the question, I like to use a hypothetical question that a uh, professor of uh, uh, pharmacology asked me during my uh, PhD program uh, interview at UCLA. And uh, the question that he asked during uh, the interview is, I'm you know, really scared by the time I'm completely convinced that uh, all other PhD program candidates are like, like 10 times smarter than me, and I'm really scared. And, and he asks me, okay, I have a, 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 a hypothetical question to ask you. If there is a pill that there is no side effect whatsoever and can make you smarter 10 times, would you take it? And uh, am I, how am I supposed to answer this question? I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm like silent for seven seconds, and he says, he, he laughs at me, yeah, this is, uh, kind of philosophical question that pharmacologists like to ask. If there is an indication that you want to modify, uh, what, what, is, what should be the philosophy? Do you, for instance, if you want to be muscular, do you exercise or do you take pharmacological you know, uh, intervention? Uh, if you get tired, um, you know, do you sleep better or do you, do you take pill? But I like to use this question to kind of um, uh, dissect this gene question into different components by also using other questions. So whenever we ask ourselves whether we are taking certain kind of treatment or not, the question whether you consciously know or not are this question. So if you have headache and there's a pill and there's some side effect, do you take it? Do you not take it? I work at your company, I tend not to take it. If there's a vaccine that prevents polio, do you get the shot, not the shot? Uh, there's a vaccine that, uh, uh, that prevents uh, uh, human papilloma virus that's sexually transmitted that could cause cancer. It could cause cancer. And if you take vaccine, you may not have cancer. Do you take the vaccine or not? Um, I know recently Azusa Pacific uh, hosted uh, uh, medical use of uh, cannabis. Do you take it? It's legal now. Um, <laughs> you know, th there are these scary sh shots that can even kill you if you dose it incorrectly, but it can, it can potentially, it may or may not cure cancer. Do you take it? Uh, and uh, uh, in vitro fertilization, it was very controversial in the 70s, and it's unclear whether all the ethical issue has been uh, clarified or not. It may still be clar uh, clarified. That, that ties to the, the question uh, that was asked earlier. Whether we discuss about the, uh, the ethics of a technique or not, maybe there's some set of people who would always think some technique is unethical and uh, in vitro fertilization was considered very unethical. So what I'm trying to get at here is when we ask about s some, some methods, we have to talk about not just method, but what indication are we using the method for and what are the risks, what, what risks are there. And the method that we are discussing here is gene editing. And for what indication can, would, you, would you take gene editing as a method of treatment? And what are the, well, some acceptable risks? Um, and I have to put another disclaimer. Although I work at drug company, I'm not going to discuss about pricing because I'm a scientist and I know almost nothing about pricing. Also, this question is already complicated enough. I don't want to add complexity to this. So um, in terms of method, from the scientific point of view, science thrives on developing new methods, new technique, so science may readily accept it. Uh, in biotech industry, it could be a little different, right? 
we want to make a technique that the patient could easily embrace. So uh, if there is a, a topical cream that you could apply to cure cancer, you would take that, right? And if that doesn't work, then you may develop pill at biotech, and uh, you kind of don't want to go to injection, but w only when you have to. But very recently, uh, the company that I work for uh, last year filed a, a method to cure cancer by injecting engineered virus. So now we can um, cure cancer. And a neighboring company in, in, in Santa Monica developed a method to cure previously untreatable blood cancer using a technique called um, a, a cell therapy that I'm going to talk about uh, soon. But so we are uh, develop, uh, increasing the different methods of, uh, of treatment in the portfolio. And this CRISPR-Cas9 method is um, uh, being discussed. But although it's being, um, it's, it's cur currently unsettled in legal disputes. So um, uh, that's, that's a good possibility. And what are acceptable methods in, in Christian, Christianity? Uh, there's incidents where, where Jesus uh, commanded, sometimes commanded multiple times, sometimes plead, okay, you could uh, get out and go into the pig. Um, uh, Paul used handkerchief. Uh, Eliza uh, uh, laid over his body over the, the patient boy who was dead. And, and so there are acceptable methods or unacceptable methods. So uh, we could move on. And uh, we could talk about diseases but we should kind of focus on what are uh, potentially treatable diseases using these technologies. And uh, genetic diseases is, uh, you know, first type of disease that, that you could uh, focus on, on de uh, developing the method. And there are over 10,000 genetic diseases that can be transmitted if you uh, receive impaired gene from just, just one of your parents. So, so there are over 10,000 mon uh, monogenic disorders, including cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, all these diseases. Um, so is it okay to treat those diseases? And not just genetic diseases, but acute B-cell lymphoblastic uh, leukemia, or LL LLL, in children. If it recurred in the children, then previously there is no cure. Um, now there is a cell therapy that was developed to treat relapsed ALL, and this cell therapy has this immediate implication that you can use gene editing technology to engineer the cell to, to use uh, in the cell therapy. Is it okay to cure cancer using this? Um, so scientifically, um, uh, these diseases are, it, it, it's approachable and uh, this LL disease is, is immedi immediately targetable. And in terms of religion, are there any diseases that's biblic biblically okay not to cure? Okay, um, so I'm like, raising more questions by trying to simplify the question. Um, <laughs> so addressing this, uh, this cell therapy that, that is immediately applicable, uh, the LLL, -L -L -L, it impacts 60,000 patients a year and peaks around uh, kids who are aged between two and five years old. And about 20% of these patients, uh, it, the, the disease comes back. And once the disease relapses, there's, there is no treatment previously, before, just in August. Um, they filed a therapy uh, called CAR T cell, ther uh, cell therapy. So what uh, this therapy does is that you collect the T cell from the patients and engineer the cell in a way that the cell could express the machine that can recognize a uh, tumor cell by putting in the DNA there using virus that uh, Professor Wood uh, talked about earlier and re-inject the engineer cell into the patient so the engineer cell can go around and kill all the cancer cell. Now, instead of using virus, is it okay um, to use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer the CAR-T? We're not really you know, changing your DNA, but is it okay to change T 
key cell DNA. Um, and this, this heart T cell therapy, uh, it, the, the price was proposed at a half million dollars per treatment. And if we could lower the cost by using a CRISPR Cas9 instead of virus, then, then would it be acceptable? Um, uh, and um, if you're here uh, uh, during uh, Ting's lecture earlier, Ting's husband, uh, George Church, uh, find a way to get rid of all the, the pig virus from the pig genome um, and removing uh, one, of the, one of the many challenges uh, associated with using pig organ uh, for uh, zero transplant. So we are not using this technique in human. And we can make this technique uh, be helpful to people by changing the pig genome. Would that be okay? Um, and risks. So uh, this is where I like to get philosophical. This is first time in the uh, four billion years of, of, of uh, geoevolution history. Um, it's first time we can intervene the heredity with unprecedented precision. But on the other hand, like what we've been discussed, we have uh, intervened the the, um, the heredity one way or another. So. Uh, so is it okay? Um, so there are still unknown risks associated with it, and um, you know, risks are unknown. But if so, um, but now the technique can really intervene the, the human gene. We, we can insert the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 complex into human zygote and uh, change how the zygote grows. So it, it, it can be a, you know, we now have a real ethical issue. Um, but if risks can be reasonably remo removed, can CRISPR-Cas9 be used? Um, and would it be even ethical to continue to develop this research? But again, like I said, what I want to say is, you know, could it first agree to learn more about it before judging whether it's acceptable or unacceptable? I think that's a really useful skill that we can take outside the science. And with that, yeah, I, how many more minutes? I sent around an outline of my comments. I don't, I'm not a good PowerPoint guy, so you have two smart people who know how to use PowerPoint and a philosopher who doesn't really. Okay, so I thought, what is it that I can sort of contribute to this discussion? I'm going to talk with some really in, well informed scientists. What is it that can a philosopher bring to this discussion? And what I wanted to sort of bring a kind of framework for how to think about through these things ethically and how to do this not just individually but how to do this in the public square. So that's the, the comments I'm going to have. And I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of thrilled and grateful to be here. Um, you know, I'm not entirely certain because uh, if, if I'm invited, if I was invited back because um, to invite, talk about another controversial topic that will be on tape. We did <laughs> recreational use of marijuana last time. I couldn't tell that's because you like me and trust me or you're trying to get rid of me and you hate me. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that is. Just keep inviting him until he says something nutty. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to try to stay out of trouble. So Let's start with this. So here, here's a, a, a kind of a governing framework, uh, kind of moral framework in uh, bioethics, biomedical ethics. It's, it's called principalism, right? And if you have the handout, that's not actually misspelled. That's how they do it. So it's principalism or the four principles view. It's a way of trying to synthesize a number of moral theories, right? So the four principles are one, uh, autonomy, right? You have to, if we're gonna ha when we're making decisions in biomedical ethics and biomedical research, we need to be able to respect the autonomy of the people with whom we're dealing. That's one principle. A second principle is beneficence, so we're trying to do good, right? That's what doctors or physicians are supposed to do, they're supposed to do good. Non-maleficence is the third principle, do no harm. And the fourth principle is justice. So the first three have to do with sort of individual care of the patient, and the fourth has to do with sort of social concerns, distribution and pricing, about which we're going to hear nothing, apparently, so at, least, at least from <laughs> Nate. So, so these are the four principles, right? Now, here's the problem with trying to use these, to apply these four principles in, in certain kinds of contentious and difficult debates like this. Um, the problem is that, that we, get the, uh, we get the illusion of consensus, because who's going to disagree with respecting people's autonomy and trying to do good and avoid doing harm and trying to bring about justice? No one's going to disagree with those things, right? So we get the illusion of consensus. The problem is it, it, we, get, we get that by having very uh, thin content on these principles, 
right? So what does it mean? What does it mean to do good? So do good and don't do evil. Fabulous, right? Okay. So you know, so with Google, right? Don't do evil. This is Google's slogan, right? But what do you do when your employees want to express certain views, right? How do you interact with the government with people's private information, right? Don't do evil sounds like a great slogan. We can all agree to it, right? But how, how do we have to flesh that out to apply it is the difficult thing, right? So one of the challenges, so this is a sort of a governing paradigm. It's not the only one, but it's a pretty common one uh, in, in bioethics and biomedical ethics. Okay, so that's a governing paradigm, and it has a problem. Namely, it's, it gets us the illusion of consensus by being very thin on content. Okay, so if we're gonna, if we're gonna try to generate some, uh, some real consensus, especially in the public square on difficult issues, what we're going to need to do is we're going to have to figure out how to give thicker content to those principles. Okay, now, so how, how is sort of the you know ethics and science and how how are these things related, and what do they have to do tell us about how we get thicker content? So here's a traditional picture. So on the on the handouts, this is a sort of tree of knowledge. And if some of you have been in my classes, you've seen the tree before, uh, right? So, and the thought is that there are certain kinds of disciplines, um, ethics, uh, psychology, medicine. Right? These are sort of applied arts, right? The art medicine, the art of caring for the body, ethics at least traditionally regarded by philosophers, the art of caring for the soul, right? And to do those things well, those normative disciplines well, you're going to have to be properly informed by what philosophers traditionally called physics, and by physics they meant what we would call the natural sciences. So you're not going to be able to do ethics or psychology or medicine well, at least according to the traditional philosophical picture, unless you're properly informed in, in what they traditionally called physics or the natural sciences. That's step one. But uh, th physics, or what we call the natural sciences, alone doesn't give you enough, enough information, right? Because it can give you, here are the facts, here's what happens, right? Um, but we, we also want to know something about what philosophers traditionally called metaphysics, right? Something outside of physics, something one step beyond physics. Um, and this, has, this is the sort of the realm of philosophers, theologians, right? What happens is we want, what we need to, do to know to say uh, do good and avoid doing evil to a human being is something about human nature, right? And, hu and to understand human nature, we have to understand both issues in the, the natural sciences and issues in metaphysics, right? Philosophy and theology, metaphysics. So those two things inform our conceptions of human nature, right? So we're gonna have to get better information there. So that's why a panel discussion like this is really, really helpful, right? Because you're actually bringing together people in the natural sciences and philosophy and hopefully the theology, these other things, to inform this. Okay, now, so far so good, but now I can't actually read what I got on my thing here. So, uh, uh, under the conception of human nature, it's, it looks, looks to me like there's going to be a bunch of different kinds of issues that might arise when we're talking about CRISPR-Cas9. So in, the, in Dr. Wu's talk earlier, there were these issues about, there's these issues about economic concerns that were coming up. There's issues about environmental concerns coming up. Those may come up in the Q&A. I want to focus on uh, questions about what we might do with this technology when it comes to human nature, right? And it looks to me like there are three types of, this, this, you know, all these are always just heuristics, right? So we can probably parse this up in a bunch of different ways. But look at there are three kind of ways, three kind of cases that we might want to think about when thinking about how to apply this technology with respect to human nature. The first are cases, and this kind of came out in, in Dr. Uh, Dr. Joe's talk, cases where we might think there's uh, a required intervention, or at least sort of prima facie required information. Right? These are the cases of uh, healing disease, right? Think cases of uh, uh, giving treatments that might prevent uh, psychological disorder, cases like this, right? Um, a second kind of a set of cases would be mere cosmetic interventions, right? So look, those aren't allowed now, but at some point that, that's got to come up, right? It seems like whenever we push technologies, they always sort of go to different places. And, and look, the governing paradigm for, for things coming out of Washington, D.C. is not going to be the governing paradigm in different uh, countries. So you're going to have these cases eventually, right? So can you make cosmetic interventions for eye color, hair color, height, weight, whatever it is, right? That's a second set of cases. And then it seems like you're going to get these third set of cases where there's going to be a dispute, right? Uh, what, you know, uh, what exactly ought we to do in these cases? So under the disputed cases, we might think of, of alleged, so two, two uh, kind of subset here. One is sort of cases of putative healing. So um, I say putative healing because you might think, well, I'm going to intervene um, to heal a disability, right? Uh, the problem is that some people think that, look, uh, having a certain disability is part of a perfectly good human identity, right? So we see this uh, aside from this kind of debate, in whether or not someone who's deaf should have a cochlear implant, right? Is that, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Is that, is that a morally permissible thing or should it be not allowed, right? So this is going to be one, these, these putative healing cases might be cases of, uh, of, of dispute, I think. Or in, ca or in case of someone who's uh, intersex, right? Sh should we intervene to change, uh, you know, the, the, the genome of someone who's intersex? 
Or should we think, no, it's just another perfectly good way of being human in the world. So these are going to be contentious cases, I take it. Uh, one other sort of case is going to be the cases of, uh, of human enhancement, right, that, that Dr. Wu was hinting at the end of her comments, right? Uh, this, these uh, issues about transhumanism, right? So can we kind of go beyond human nature? Can we do these things? Okay, I'm going to do the last two sections quickly to keep under time. So third part of the talk. It seems to me when we, when we talk about sort of the metaphysics part of our uh, identities, sort of our metaphysical commitments, our theological commitments, there, there's, there's, no, um, there's no disinterested neutral ground. So it looks to me like we're, we're just going to have to own what it is that, that we actually think about these deep metaphysical, phys philosophical, theological commitments. So many of you in the room are going to self-identify as Christians, right? And so I think, look, if you're going to self-identify as Christians, then self-identify as Christians. And when you come to the public square, Think about doing bioethics in a distinctively Christian way. Now, don't get weirded out, right? You think, like, uh-oh, right? Because if, if you're sitting here and you're an Orthodox Jew, then come to the public square as an Orthodox Jew. If you're a committed Confucian, then come to the public square as a committed Confucian. So come that way, but let's be fully informed. So I'm going to speak from my tradition, Christianity, right? So one of the things is you're going to have to, if you're going to come to do bioethics and think about human nature, your conception of human nature is going to be different. It's going to be informed by sacred scripture. It's going to be informed by sacred tradition. It's going to be informed by reason. It's going to be informed by experience there. I did, just did the Quetzalcoatlian quadrilateral. APU students know what I just did there, right? So uh, <laughs> you're welcome, theology department. So, uh, so, so look, you're, you're going to need to bring all of those things together, it seems to me, into the, into the public square. Now, let me say something that's particularly important about, about um, this for, for many folks. In the Wesleyan tradition, right, uh, the emphasis on sacred tradition is important. That's similar to the Roman Catholic tradition. That's similar to the Eastern Orthodox tradition. For some Protestants, that's not such a robust thing. It seems to me that those of you who self-identify as Christians and are going to go into healthcare fields need to be more familiar with sacred tradition, right? Uh, not just scripture, but primarily scripture, because Christ is the, the great physician. Uh, Christ shows, like, uh, you know, that, uh, here are things that are worth healing, here are things that are not worth healing, right? Th these are things that Christ shows, in part. But there's also plenty of things in sacred tradition about, about medical practice. So if you read the canons of the early church councils, there are many things about, about practice. So it's very weird to me. Like when I have students sometimes in class, we'll have a discussion about abortion. I say, well, couldn't find anything about it in the Bible explicitly. So I don't know, right? So I'm going to think that scripture and tradition don't speak to that. I think, well, I don't know if your reading of scripture is right, but your reading of sacred tradition is certainly wrong, right? Because there, there are lots of things in sacred tradition where it talks about different kinds of, of medical procedures, right, that people should and should not engage in. So I think, I think this is going to be very important if you're, if you're going to be sort of doing bioethics, right? You should do it in a robust mode, right? I talked about this way to the Christians since I assume many of the people, most of the people in the room are Christians. But I think that's true if you're a Jew or like my friend in Hong Kong who's a, who's a Confucian, right? You, we got to bring our full selves to the table. I'm going to wrap up quickly the last section. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you might think here's fourth part, uh, sort of the public square. You might think, yeah, yeah, but uh, that we can't do that in the public square. You got to bracket all that stuff, right? I think, no, no, that, that's, that's to be ignorant of our civic tradition, right? John Stuart Mill in On Liberty says, like, you know, everyone should sort of bring their ideas and they should be fully tested in the public square. So we need to bring our full selves to the public square, right? We need to be, ha we need to be willing to have, like, honest and robust ag agreements. And then, but we, what we can't do is just be so parochial, right, that we, it's either my way or the highway, or we get the sort of beautiful, uh, sarcastic, contention that we have between, in political discourse now, right? We, eventually, we need to look for overlapping consensus, right? I'm a Christian, I think this. You're a Jew, you think that. You're a Confucian, you think that. Okay, but we all agree in this space. Let's at least try to work from that space, right? So principalism alone, the governing paradigm, wrapping it up, principalism alone, governing paradigm, not going to work. Going to have to think more about, more deeply about human nature. Got to think more deeply about human nature from within our distinct, robust commitments, bring our whole selves into the public square. Come there honestly and come there with a lot of grace. That's the sort of framing for some of the q and I hope. So thanks so much for having me back. I'm looking forward to Q&A. Okay, so we're now going to move to our Q&A time. And I'm going to do is basically um, just read some of the questions and give the panelists a chance to respond. Um, yeah. So, uh, the first question is, what are your thoughts on transhumanism and the possibility of immortality through gene editing? What do I think about that? In my experience talking with variety of communities, I think I've come to respect the huge diversity and personal reasons people choose to like something or not like something. So this is not me chickening out. <laughs> um, 
I think that I'm malleable in that. I can talk to people who can argue that they absolutely need this particular, they need immortality. And it's hard for me to argue against that. And I can har talk to someone else who really is against transhumanism. And I guess I'm just gonna say, I think this is a personal choice. This is why PG Ed wants to inform everyone. It's a personal choice. Now in the extremes, I will say that I don't think it's a good idea to harm people, but it's hard for me to judge people's choices, unless that question is about me personally. <laughs> I'm pretty satisfied with the way I personally have wonderful things in my life. I don't think I want to ask for more. I've never really felt that immortality is something that I'm striving for. So um, I guess I will just mm -hmm. leave it at that. Anyone else want to? No, no, you go right ahead. <laughs> Be my guest. <laughs> I didn't have enough time to formulate my answer. Uh, I, I could tell you this. Last night, I, I got my hair cut because, you know, I, I'm gonna come, I, I don't always look this nice. I, I want it to look <laughs> nice. And I got, got my hair cut. And my hair st starts graying, so I, I colored my hair. Uh, so I, I definitely intervened with my natural, f uh, you know, uh, uh, physics and um, is that okay? Um, you know, the, what I do with uh, changing the way I look is, is that is that okay? Is that not okay? Uh, are you guys do you guys oppose hair coloring? Are you guys for hair coloring? I um, <laughs> this question is impossible to address without being philosophical, and I, I'm not a philosopher, but I I could tell you this. Um, <laughs> My my pet theology. I, I started listening to uh, like theology lectures uh, from Yale and Princeton, and when I listen to this, I cannot understand 75 percent of of, uh, of of what they say, and probably the other 25 I'm misunderstanding. <laughs> but one one lecture that I heard is this idea of of all in all. We see what's going on with um, uh, uh, you know crazy disagreement between di different parts of the country and, and different polarity of the, the, um, uh, the, the government parties and uh, uh, morally and theologically unacceptable events are occurring. And uh, according to Paulian theology, we, to put it bluntly, simply, they occur because God allowed it to occur, okay? And what you may think is irreconcilably against your belief, but you have to trust that, that God is able to turn that into something beautiful and use that to achieve his will. I, I hope I'm answering your question, but Transhumanism. I, I'm I'm okay with the way I am, mostly except my hair color, <laughs> and yeah, I, and I, I'm okay with dying. So yeah, I, that, that's my answer. All right. all right. Well, first of all, on behalf of the people who have not dyed their hair, I just want to say, oh yeah. So here are my people. These are my people, right? It's all right. It's okay. We don't have to do that. Um, so second point. Um, one of the, so I love the topic of transhumanism, and here's why. Because you know, like if if I just if I just do like philosophy stuff, people say like, "You philosophers are weird," <laughs> right? right? And I go, "Philosophers are weird because they're responding to ways in which the world is weird," right? So, so this is it's, uh, usually when you have like a weird philosophical question, like give it a, give it have a little patience or try to tease out like why did someone ask that question, right? So it's not like. What if we can alter, so if someone comes to you and says, what if we could alter your, you know, a, a human being so they could have, you know, and then you add whatever transhumanist uh, uh, enhancement is, and you think, like, why would anyone ask that question? It's because we're faced with it, right? That's why, that's, that's why. So I think the topic's fascinating. There are sort of two issues there. Uh, on the first one, you know, what, what to make of it, um, I guess there's just so much going on. It's like asking, like, 
what do you guys, what do you think of the uh, of the U.S. government? And I think, well, there's a lot going on in the U.S. government, right? <laughs> Can I have a more specific detail? So I, I guess I'd have to hear like what some of the details are about uh, when we're talking about transhumanism, and find out one. Um, are the, these transhumanist, any, for any given proposed transhumanist change, is it a change in something, the, the degree of some capacity we already possess, greater intelligence, greater height, right? then, then, then it just looks like, are these just ways of doing what we could do indirectly through nutrition or selecting mates or you know, other, other things, right? Um, so I guess I have to hear the details about the proposed transhumanist thing. Is it just changes of things we have in degree or is it changes of kind? Like, no, we want to do something to change the species. I think, oh, okay, well, that seems like it's more problematic to me than the first type of case. Um, the second part of the question was about immortality. And this is, it's interesting, so when I, when I talk about, you know, in philosophy of mind, when I talk to my, like, my intro students, we have a little, in, you know, philosophy of mind section, right? we ask, like, what, I, what are you, what are you exactly? Are you identical to your brain? Are you a brain and a soul? Are you just a soul? And I ask these questions, and I, you know, the freshman students, like, look at me like, and I go, like, well, why is he doing this to us, right? It's like, well, because this is, this is, this is what, what's, Underlying this issue about tran about uh, immortality with respect to transhumanism, right? So this thought of uh, so one way of being immortal immortal on the transhumanist conception, somehow I could un upload my consciousness to silicon, like on a computer or something. Um, that's a view in tr in philosophy of mind, roughly called uh, functionalism. Uh, if you're following along from your intro class, um, I guess I'm pretty skeptical that that's even possible. So if you ask me, like, what do you think of that? I think like I'm pretty skeptical that's possible actually. But um, so we'll let me let's let's see let's see the details right of these things. So I've talked too long. Sorry. To briefly add one more thing, uh, it could be a hypothetical question because technologically, uh, you know, you got, it's probably almost impossible to start having us grow wings and, you know, like stuff like that. But science being what it is, if there's a way to find <laughs> things, it'll, it'll thrive on developing new things and maybe it's not far too fetched. But the real uh, difficult question to answer is if, there is transhumanism, of all these technologies are available, then we cannot separate that from capitalism. And what that means is that those who can afford, you know, let's say these techniques are available, then only those who can afford will be able to improve their, 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 their physics. And it's, you know, is, is that okay? Not only uh, the socioeconomic disparity will be in the realm of socioeconomy, but now it can you know, bleed into changing the genetic makeup of, of the people who belong to you know, different socioeconomic uh, uh, classes. Now, I, I think that's a, a more important question rather than the technology itself that, that, that we, we kind of have to you know, worry about. So on that note, um, that leads nicely to our next question, which is in the early 1900s, eugenics was a very prevalent concept in both Europe and in America. Um, and it was done more, it was done basically via d techniques that we found to be very atrocious, i.e. the Nazis and things like that. Um, what is um, CRISPR's potential to start that up again? I think that if we don't make sure that everyone is part of the conversation, if we leave people out especially particular communities out, I think the potential is quite great. On the other hand, no matter where I go, I see such a unified abhorrence about what happened and a purpose to have it not happen that I think if we can just give energy to that and let that go, I think that we can keep it to a minimum. Now, is there eugenics ongoing on now? Yes, I think there already is. We judge each other a lot. That's the beginning of eugenics. You judge one person better than someone else. If we can address, separate from CRISPR, our tendency to pass judgment on each other, maybe we can have some kind of protection in place, even as we f um, fight to make ex access to information uh, better. So did I answer the question? I think it's possible, but I think we can also prevent it. It directly goes against what Christianity is all about. Although, in the history, people used Christianity to justify eugenics. But I, in, in, in my understanding of Christianity, eugenics is everything that's not Christian. In Christianity, 
if you want to be a leader, you want to you have to serve. Like you 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 have to wash the feet of your disciple your your students. You have to consider uh, other people greater than you. Uh, so I, I think our job is to be the light and salt. I mean, just real quick follow up. So I, that to Dr. what Dr. Wood said, I, I think that uh, I, I agree that f for any given type of technology, can the technology be abused? And the answer is, well, certainly, right? Um, but I don't think that should stop us from trying to find productive ways of using that technology. Right? Mm -hmm. um, next question is, um, there's been multiple talk about treating disease and the idea of potential enhancements such as wings and things like that. Um, <laughs> the question presented was, um, what are the criteria to draw the line between treating disease and actually enhancing? I'll start. So it's interesting. So um, uh, Bree knows this, right? So it, when, when I had the, when we did our bioethics class uh, before, and when we do it, we'll, we'll do it again in the next fall. And th this is the, the, the topic we start with: is what what in the world is a disease, right? So so in the so in the and we read, read this moderately provocative article, right? In the nineteenth century, masturbation was considered a disease, right? So how do you classify diseases, right? And, and there are things that move in and out of class being classified as disorders in psychology, right? So so how do you how do you do this? Um, how do you, you know, analyze these concepts? That's an issue in sort of, sort of, uh, you know, in metaphysics, right? How do we, how do we analyze concepts of disease and disorder? I don't have, I don't have like a quick, snappy answer for that, right? When we spend a bunch of time in, in class thinking about this over the course of a semester. But I do want to point out that it's, it's again, this is just, you know, uh, do good, don't do evil. Uh, fabulous. That's not, that's not sufficiently helpful. Okay. Well, I'll only allow this to heal diseases, right, and disorders. Okay. Well. That, that still is, that's just sort of moving the bump in the rug, right? It's, you, you've just given us a different concept, but the concept still needs to be fleshed out, right? So I, this is where I think that dialogue between, uh, you know, the f physics, the natural sciences, and metaphysics, philosophy and theology, is, is really, really important. So I don't have a snappy answer other than to say that the only way to do this is to actually continue working together and expanding conversations like this. So I was in a classroom once, and um, it was a classroom most of the, actually all the, students were people of color. It was um, about 35 students and 30, I think, were African American black and Asian and uh, Hispanic were the rest. And we were talking about this, this issue, sort of not as directly. The students asked each other, what, if you could change a trait, mm -hmm. what would it be? So it wasn't a disease, it was a trait. Mm -hmm. And one, um, Black student raised her hand and said, very seriously, she said, I would want to have blonde hair and blue eyes, which to me was a surprise because we, there's a lot of pride in who you are. And the explanation was that she would be safer mm -hmm. if she had blonde hair and blue eyes. So what we so easily treat as a, a trait that's not essential for for life. Mm -hmm. For her, it really was. Mm -hmm. she, this was in a, not a great part of town. And so for her, that was a medical way to treat a socioeconomic disparity. Mm -hmm. I can't really add much to that. So at what point is improvement just improvement for the sake of improving? Uh, alteration, it, it could uh, make you safer. Um, uh, and uh, I think one of the fundamental question is um, bet between Muslim and Christianity in, in Muslim culture, I, I don't know, if, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, if difficulty occurs, if challenge occurs, then they accept it as uh, what's provided by God and they just endure it. Uh, I, I don't know if that idea is also prevalent in Christianity, but also Christianity, we want to go out of the boundary and uh, make other people's lives better, and um, uh, we want to go out of the comfort zone and and uh, make changes. Um, and if these improvements can I I improve the safety, um, I, I think it's okay. Um, is it okay? And, and there was a recent work done at UCSF where they found that there are two, two different immune systems. One, it starts attacking. The other immune system, uh, it 
uh, makes the, the part of the immune system that attacks attack less. And what they found is that when they strengthen th these regulators, then it treated uh, like bald hair. And uh, is that a disease or improvement? So, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, these questions raise more questions about how we define the improvements and how, how we define diseases. Uh, so the follow-up question to that um, was someone asked, so I know Nate, you kind of mentioned this, but what are the chances of us creating something superhuman with CRISPR-Cas9? And when you, if you, in addressing that, what does that look like? So you said no wings, so <laughs> can I turn into Spider-Man? Is that? How about, uh, uh, you know, I, I could say this because I, uh, I'm losing hair. <laughs> People who don't lose hair, I, I don't know. So what kind of superhuman um, do you have in mind? <laughs> I know there are genes that could make uh, mammals muscular. <laughs> so there are many variants now that are known that can uh, increase muscle mass. I didn't go through the list, can affect your ability to withstand pain, can um, make you resistant to the flu virus. These are all things that are possible. But I'm, I'm wondering if someone is proposing something that we haven't even seen yet, <laughs> some kind of true superhero. Mm -hmm. um, look where we've come in 100 years. I think it would not be out of the question to use this toolbox and create better vision or uh, extraordinary capacity to smell odors. Um, I know that people are looking for the variants associated with intelligence. Huge, controversial area. Variants that are associated with better memory. Variants that are associated with quicker response. Um, they're looking for those. Are we going to use them in the right way? I think that's what this discussion is about. So on to an ethical question, and more of a theological one is, um, in, in scripture there are examples to where God was not happy with humans because they aspired to be God. Um, so in what way is, the, can you draw, is there a way to draw a line between aspiring to be God and he healing, especially in the case of CRISPR-Cas9? I, I like the fact that in the last question, everyone, you didn't even look to me. You're like, you, yeah, I know you have no, I know, Rico, that you have no clue what the answer to this question is. Uh, but then this, question, then this question came up and you looked right at me. So, uh, okay, I guess it's my turn. Um, so I guess two parts. So first part, um, I, in some ways this is, um, this isn't all that different from many things we've had in the past, right? So uh, transplants, blood transfusions, right? There, there are many things that I think initially, the initial shock is like, you know, we're playing God, right? And then, then at some point you guys, well, maybe not, right? Maybe, maybe we're working with God to bring healing. Um, so, I, so, I first, so, so the first point is just I wanted to note that I don't think we should sort of, um, over those of us who are Christ, identify as Christians or some religious tradition where you think, you know, we're supposed to live in accordance with nature or God's will, we shouldn't overreact, right? Let's, let's, let's be sensitive to the fact that there are many things that people who came before us thought, well, this is completely objectionable. Now we go, ah, you know. Um, now maybe that's just because we're, you know, we're probate or something, right? We're, we're very bad, but, uh, or, but maybe it's because you know, there's, there's something to think about, right? So I think we, we can look at those kind of cases and then next point, we might be able to reason by analogy from those cases, right? And so you're like, okay, so what, what, what are analogous ways that we might be able to actually do good? Um, so that's a point. And then the related point is, um, I think you know, the, the playing God part uh, that that charge looks like it sticks only if we think we're doing something contrary to you know to to God's will and, and but that's going to require us to do some have some sort of conception of a richer conception of human nature, right? Uh, and so look now it looks like we are violate if if you think this is the case right we are violating God's will with respect to human nature because we're trying to create some you know a creature somehow that's sort of outside of God's design or something. But I think like well let, let's wait and hear what the details are right if it's just increased muscle mass or you know increased memory it's like those are, I mean, th th depending on what the, those changes exactly look like, uh, greater ability to smell, right? It, those are just in, uh, you know, in, in, in 
in, you know, within the species enhancements of qualities we already possess, right? Um, and things w that we already try to do, you know, by, by other types of natural means. So, so I think we need to be careful not to overreact, learn a bit from the past, and let's sort of find out what the details are specifically before we start overreacting, so. And you probably have expansive uh, view about this. Well, actually, what came to mind is um, global warming. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't, I know there are different views of what, whether global warming is something we need to worry about or responsible for. Um, so w let's just talk about the environment, controlling our environment. I think that human beings have already greatly altered our environment and that we have the capacity and knowledge now, some, not all, to maybe mitigate some of the problems we have caused, whether or not you believe in global warming. And um, one could ask, can we go back to the way things are? We would have to give up our way of life. So in a way, we may have passed the point of no return. I don't know if that's playing God or not, but we are shaping our environment in a way, in a very knowledgeable, purposeful way. And I think in some cases, um, if you can save lives, you can help the planet become healthier. That is like playing God in a way. Um, but I think many people would agree that this is something we need to heal. So when, uh, during my first year of graduate school, I had a kind of my uh, uh, theological challenging time. Uh, before I started PhD program, I was a chemist, and after I started PhD program, I started playing with bac bacteria. I would insert DNA, so I, I think I was talking about this uh, earlier, and have bacteria make the protein that I would like it to make. And I'm wondering, man, am I, am I playing God? God created this bacteria, and I'm doing this. Well, um, to kind of address it in a light way, you guys, do you guys know the joke? You know, the scientists come, come up with a way, I found a way to create life from dirt. And God goes, okay, uh, go ahead. And here's the dirt. And God goes, that's my dirt, right? <laughs> you know, we could create this technology to the death, but we don't, we don't compare it to God, okay? Uh, I'm just making, just putting this small DNA in there and uh, bacteria, I, I, I think it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's not smart and it just makes the, the thing that I program it to make. But I find it's, it's really, really smart, but, you know, but th this bacteria, and God created this. And I'm just, you know, borrowing the, the, this amazing thing that God created this. And playing God, I think we have to separate um, the, the meanings of what playing God, what, it, what does it mean to play God? I think real um, uh, offense that, that God uh, addressed in that scripture is that when a human started exerting their own will for themselves, when they, they started practicing wills to um, self-centered wills, then they're each playing God, right? Instead of serving others and, and um, and loving others the way you love them. That, when you, you don't do that, and when you do things to enrich yourself, then, then that's, that's playing God. Um, so we're actually out of time. So sorry we're not able to get all the questions. Um, I'm sure the panelists would happy to be happy to hang out for a minute or two to answer questions. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists.